we'll go ahead and get started here. It's the top of the hour. Uh, my name is Josh Luthi. I'm part of the product innovation team here at Flojo BD. Today we'll be looking at a intro to SeekGeek, our single cell RNA sequencing uh, analysis platform. Um, so just the basics, you know, what is SeekGeek? SeekGeek is our single cell gene expression analysis software for the bench scientist. Okay, we try to be um, data agnostic and it's easy to load a variety of different file types into SeekGeek real um, simply by just drag and dropping into the workspace. Uh, SeekGeek can read CSV, TSV, matrix formats, um, H5 files, and others as well. Um, BD has a pipeline with Seven Bridges Genomics um, that exports CSV files. Um, 10X platform, for example, from Cell Ranger exports H5 files. Um, with SeekGeek, we can gate or cluster on individual genes, gene sets, or synthetic parameters to define different populations in the workspace. Um, from within the graph window, we can <clears throat> compare populations and define gene sets of differentially expressed gene products. Uh, SeekGeek is really flexible and integrates with other programming environments like R and Python <clears throat> in the form of plugins. Um, SeekGeek is also um, intuitive and allows a scientist to identify biological processes and define novel populations. So why use SeekGeek? Well, um, SeekGeek really makes it simple and enjoyable for you, the scientist, to explore your own single cell RNA sequencing data without um, a bioinformatician. Um, it requires no programming knowledge. Um, again, just making it real easy to use. <clears throat> of course, if you are familiar with programming languages and interested in turning some of your code into a SeekGeek plugin, I'd be happy to discuss um, that further with you as well. Um, again, SeekGeek is flexible and, and can load um, several different file types from different um, platforms. Um, with this flexibility, we can also merge in um, known pieces of information, such as um, subject, treatments, time points. These are often referred to as categorical parameters. Um, these are useful to separate events in an expression matrix or to make comparisons um, later in your analysis. And if you already know Flojo SeekGeek, um, learning curve is, is very minimal. Uh, you'll see that just the layout of the workspace and the way you interact with the data um, is very similar to uh, how you do that in Flojo. So just to get an idea here of um, the workspace and its layout, right? Um, if you are, again, familiar with Flojo, you, you'll notice it's um, <clears throat> laid out in a similar fashion. So at the top of the, the workspace here, we have um, a ribbon and um, the different tabs here. And the tabs group together different bands, which hold um, these buttons that allow us to perform different actions on our data. And in the upper section here, we have um, gene sets. And down below, we have samples and um, any sample analysis, like um, gating we might have um, done on our samples. Double clicking on sample or any of these gated populations We'll open a graph window so you can um, start your analysis. I'm just taking a closer view of the graph window here. With um, single cell RNA seq data, we have many parameters to search through. So um, the X and Y wings here on the, the right and left side of the graph window um, are expandable and it allows you to quickly search for um, parameters of interest. So here, um, for example, 
um, search for CD3E. Uh, and so we have to remember, we are thinking possibly um, an RNA, which is gene names, not protein names, for example. Uh, CD3 is a, a complex and the protein CD3 epsilon is a subunit of that. So if you search for CD3, you may see several different subunits of that. Um, so you have to look for the specific transcript you're interested in. And in some cases, the, the CD nomenclature is not used at the, at the genetic level for gene names. So again, here on the right, um, PTPRC is um, CD45, but if you were to search for CD45, you'll not find it in this data set because we're using gene names and not protein names. Um, so you can always go to something like the NCBI database and search for the protein and find the gene name that corresponds to it. And then at the top of the graph window, um, we have um, these different gating tools, right? Similar to what we see in Flojo, um, rectangle gate, quad gates, ellipse, and then um, some different type of polygon gates. And that's where you'll draw um, a gate around a population of events to create um, new populations in your workspace. A um, little more detail here in the graph window. So when you start looking at data, um, you'll find that RNA measurements are in a much smaller dynamic range. Usually we're looking at log or linear scale, and you're gonna have measurements that are on the orders of tens to hundreds of RNAs compared to thousands of protein subunits that might be expressed on the surface of cells for flow cytometry measurements. And so um, with that, I just wanted to make sure you guys are aware of this um, T button or transform button to transform the data display here in the graph window. When you first load in data um, and you're looking at both RNA and protein measurements, um, the scaling may not be ideal for every measurement that you're viewing. And so um, here we're, we're using um, ArcSign Transform to give better resolution to the events around zero. Um, and this transform allows for adjustment of both linear range here around zero and then a log scale at the upper end of the range. Um, down in this um, section here, it's an expandable um, option menu where you can change um, between different plot types. Here we're looking at um, a contour plot and we have outliers shown, which um, show up as dots there in the graph window. So this view, as well as like density plots, um, can help us visualize potential cutoffs for setting thresholds to cut between um, positive and negative populations. We also have um, color axis here, um, and this can allow us to show a third parameter heat map across this um, two-dimensional space. This is um, pretty useful once we create um, dimensionally reduced space uh, to see which islands might be expressing for different markers. Um, we also have um, some more control here over resolution um, of the plots. Um, so we, from here, we can really create some nice high resolution images in the layout editor and export those um, in different types of formats. And so different from Flojo here in the graph window is um, the gene view. Um, <clears throat> if you wanna look at genes that make up these populations and compare them, then we need to click on this gene view button at the top of the graph window there. And so on the left here, we're looking um, again at cell views. So this is, um, just like a normal bivariate dot plot um, you would see in flow cytometry, where 
Um, each dot is one or more measured events or cells, and drawing a gate here will make a new population back in the workspace. Um, once you click that gene view button at the top of the graph window, here in the right now, um, the gene view will, will toggle the graph into a differential expression profile. Um, and each dot is now a measured parameter, either a gene or a protein. And we're summing the expression of all the cells um, in population one versus population two. Um, and then those uh, populations are shown on the X and Y axes here. So um, we're looking at T cells and B cells um, that was shown displayed here in, in this left graph window in cell view. Um, so those two populations are basically um, here in gene view are balancing their expressions along this diagonal. And anything that is directly on the diagonal is equally expressed between the two populations. And anything that is off the diagonal are differentially expressed. So here we um, have identified um, what is up in T cells versus B cells and what is up in B cells versus T cells. So you can draw gates here in gene view, um, and this will define different gene sets. However, we don't really know what um, or where the threshold of significance is in this view. So we'll want to use the button at the top of the graph window to create a volcano plot. Um, again, gating uh, in cell view makes new populations in the workspace. Um, while gating in uh, gene view will make new gene sets. So clicking the volcano plot um, allows us to derive these observations of um, fold change versus Q value, where Q value is uh, modified P value, correcting for the multiple comparisons and false discovery rates in this analysis. Um, the volcano plots show each gene or protein measurement and compares the two populations that you set on the X and Y axes in the previous view, and now allows you to gate here on these genes um, that are upregulated in one population versus the other. Um, so here uh, we're gating on a threshold of significance. So um, might be a little hard to see, but right here there's a dotted line going across. And this is um, a p-value or the q-value where you can set um, these different thresholds within um, preferences and SeqGeek. And then, um, so here we're gating on like four on full change that is four times up in b versus t or t versus b. And again, with this, I'm creating two um, gene sets by these gates. Um, these are the two gene sets that are um, defining the parameters that are differentially expressed between these two particular populations. Um, you can also, in this top corner, um, choose to look at um, all genes by default or um, as we'll see a little bit later on in the live demo, um, if we've created a gene set maybe of just highly variable genes, you can toggle um, between those different genes and what's displayed in these volcano plots. Okay, so again, that gating right, creates um, these new analytical gene sets, and it contains um, a number of different measured parameters. If I double click on these gene sets, um, we'll see a list view um, showing us uh, more information. We'll, we'll take a closer look on the next slide. Um, and if you were to click um, to edit, when you're in that list view to edit that gene set, it'll bring you back to that volcano plot where we can um, make any edits to that particular gate and what's included within that gene set. 
Um, then we have uh, static gene sets. So you could um, also create like a new static gene set. And these are user defined. Um, so you can give them a name and add any, um, any of the measurements and place it into the static gene set. Um, you can make comparisons between these gene sets. So there's a tool up here, um, gene set comparisons. Um, so for example, I can look at the intersection between two sets of genes and ask the question if my up and T cells overlaps with um, the gene set from Taroche et al, um, which is comes with um, Seeky, but we have one in there for T cells. And yes, we can see um, right here that um, there are five transcripts that are in both of these gene sets. And if we have a gene set library, um, we can right click on one of these gene sets that we've created and do a gene set enrichment analysis if we have that particular um, gene set library downloaded on our computer. Any of these can also be exported into a spreadsheet um, or um, text editor or something like that. And you can take those um, that information online um, to other databases like Panther or Enricher and see um, what those genes um, might be describing for your data. So if I were to double click on any of those gene set, this is the, the view we would get here. This is just um, those parameters in a list view along with some statistics. It shows me um, all the parameters, fold chains, Q values um, that we used um, to gate and define those genes. If you were to click um, on that edit gene set button down at the bottom, again, that bring us back to that volcano plot because it's linked to that gate. And so we can make any adjustments there if we wanted. Um, the other option on the right is static gene set. So these are again, user defined. And so um, up at the top, we can give it a name. And on the left is where we might be like selecting um, some genes that we wanna add into this new gene set we're creating. You can also um, import CSV files um, as uh, gene sets into SeaGeek. <clears throat> um, one of the common steps here is also um, just performing some dimensionality reduction. So in the Analyze tab of the workspace, we go dimensionality reduction. And um, one of the first steps we have to perform is principal component analysis. Um, this just helps to compress the what might be a sparse data matrix into something that's more amenable to our um, other machine learning algorithms like TSNE, UMAP, or TriMAP. And by default here, um, it's just going to create 25 um, principal components that we can um, select from once it's complete. And here on the right is um, the type of results that you typically get from PCA. Here we see a nice separation of different subpopulations and um, principal component space. And these are just essentially showing us where our global neighborhoods are for the different cell subsets. Over on the left, we see um, what would be um, the result from running PCA where it shows us those 25 principal components and we can choose which ones we wanna retain for downstream steps. And so typically the first you know, 10, 15 principal components um, describe um, most of the variance within the data. So um, I typically select about 15 and just continue forward with those. You can, um, always just grab all 25 and then just choose to use you know a smaller subset of those when you're doing um, downstream steps like uh, TSNE or, or even clustering. If you want to dig a little bit deeper into the data, 
Um, next, we would run something like um, T-SNE or T-Stochastic Neighbor Embedding. And the reason we did PCA in the previous step was to compress this data into something uh, more amenable to these advanced algorithms like T-SNE. <clears throat> Um, and TSNE can help us find more nuanced differences in these subpopulations and display that in two dimensions. The different islands you know, would represent heterogeneity within the data matrix, which you can try to identify later in downstream steps. So on the left, we can see, again, the dimensionality reduction platform where we're choosing the TSNE method. And when we click Select Genes, um, here, we'll, this time we'll go um, into the selector and we'll choose our parameters and then search for our principal components. And we'll use these when we run TSNE. Um, we have OpsNE enabled here um, in SeatGeek. So um, pretty much, I would say it's just highly optimized. And if you just choose uh, with the auto option here, um, you don't really need to make any adjustments um, down here. And you can just go ahead and run TSNE and you'll typically get um, pretty nice embeddings in that way. Oh, sorry, I see I do have a question. <clears throat> um, so yeah, someone is asking, uh, does SeatGeek have ACS format? Um, and they say, I use Flojo with ACS format, and it goes to previous gating position. I want to change the gating and save it, and asking if they have any solutions for that. Um, so SeatGeek um, does have a similar type of format, like an archive for Flojo or an ACS for Flojo, um, but they're just called Geek Zips. And it's, again, similar where it's just like a, um, compressed folder that contains like the workspace, um, your data matrix, or um, maybe some derived parameters that might be created from some plugin processes. Um, and that's pretty nice because it's all self-contained in that folder. So you can basically just take that geek zip and um, move it around, like email it to a colleague, put it on an um, external drive somewhere, and all that information just stays contained directly within it. So um, you can even open it from like your network drive. And when it opens, it's actually going to uh, open um, into a local cache folder in your machine. Um, and, and so it's not like reading this data over like a network drive, for example, where you might um, experience some, you know, performance hit trying to read data over the network. So geek zips are pretty flexible in that regard. Um, as far as like the issue uh, you're asking about with um, previous gating positions, um, I'd have to take a closer look. I would suggest just probably um, sending us an email at flojo at bd.com, and then we can um, take a closer look that way. Uh, someone's asking if UMAP is available. Yes, we have um, UMAP, TriMAP, HackMap, FATE, um, many different types of embedding options. Um, and those come, TSNE is native to, uh, the application, these other ones, uh, you can install in the form of plugins. Um, most of those I just mentioned there um, are real simple to install. You just download the plugin jar file and put it into your plugins folder. And it has all the dependencies in it because they run in Python. Some other plugins might um, run in R. And so you'd have to have like R installed separately and make sure those packages are installed as well. But UMAP, for example, runs in Python, so it's real simple. Just put that jar in your plugins folder, and it should just um, work for you right out of the box. Uh, and I can show you guys an example of that in the live demo. All 
Okay, so our um, PCA guided t scheme results here are shown um, in the graph window. And I've applied here a third color axis parameter to show the areas that are expressing for MITF gene. Um, <clears throat> and the MITF gene provides instructions for making a protein called melanocyte inducing transcription factor. Um, and these gene variants have been found in people with an aggressive form of skin cancer called melanoma. So here I've gated on two clusters or areas in that T-SNE space and called them malignant one and malignant two to define these new populations in the workspace. Um, <clears throat> and next, what we can do is pivot to that gene view and determine what is you know, up and down regulated between these two populations using those volcano plots. Um, and so once we've found um, those particular gene sets, like what is um, upregulated in one of those populations versus the other, um, we may want to uh, visualize some of that information in the layout editor. And it's really easy to do that. You can just open your layout, drag your two populations of interest um, into the layout. And for example, I've overlaid those two populations that I gated in t -SNE space um, to create this overlay. <clears throat> and then I right-clicked and selected to make a heat map and then choose and then selected that um, gene set that was twofold up in malignant one and was able to generate this heat map here showing the comparison between those two populations, malignant one and two. And we also have some other plugins for example, violin box, where we can visualize um, gene expression that way as well. There's some native clustering options um, directly in SeekGeek as well. Um, here I'm showing k-means clustering. So in the analyze tab, again, you can go to clustering and you choose um, the k-means clustering algorithm uh, that we then input um, a name, if you'd want to name your derived parameter in a certain way, and um, enter a K number for how many clusters do we want returned. Um, then um, we'll get some clustering results, but to get those back into the workspace, we can use the AutoGate categorical tool, and, and that'll automatically gate apart those populations um, found by k-means and return those back into the workspace. We also have some other um, types of clustering algorithms that we can look at too. Um, and just real quick, some additional features um, here in SeekGeek. At the top, we have um, a normalization platform. So, right, this is right, an important consideration for any analysis and it helps to remove sequencing bias that we know exists in single cell RNA sequencing experiments. Um, one of the most common ones here is um, uh, researchers might wanna just normalize data um, based on a particular number of counts per cell. Um, for this type of normalization, there's um, the counts per option. Um, and typically we, we find that counts per 10,000 um, is a good option for most RNA. Um, and this will effectively set the library size for all cells to be equivalent. Um, we also have a QC option. So um, starting QC and SeekGeek, you'll be presented with these um, three different um, QC windows. The first one, uh, being cell view. Um, and this can allow us to uh, remove outlier events, which might um, represent empty wells or doublets based on library size versus genes expressed. So if we have a low number of library size and a low number of genes expressed, these might be empty wells down here. And we wanna exclude those from our analysis. And up here, high library size, high number of genes expressed, those could be doublets. 
So again, we just draw a gate and exclude those events there. Um, the first gene view window in this QC platform is showing us um, total reads versus cells expressing. Um, and a drawing a gate here can help us filter out um, parameters found in very few cells with only um, minimal expression values, as well as genes that uh, might we might consider housekeeping genes and might not be of interest to us. And those housekeeping genes are usually found up here with high number of reads and high number of cells expressing. Um, and then the third graph window again is in gene view. And this shows us cells expressing versus dispersion. Um, and the gate here uh, allows us to further gate on um, what we would call highly dispersed or highly variable genes. Um, and these are usually the ones that help us pull apart more biologically relevant subsets within the data when we start to begin um, dimensionality reduction using principal component analysis and TSNE, for example. Um, we again have um, enrichment tests that we can run against our, our um, genes that we've created using um, gene set library files. There's some of those that come with um, SeekGeek demo data. Uh, and then we also have um, several different plugins um, available to run certain steps or even entire pipelines directly in SeekGeek. So just real quick, some of the um, plugins available um, kind of categorize here, some like pre-processing type plugins, um, auto gate categorical. So if you have categorical information in your matrix and you wanna gate those apart, um, we have a plugin that can do that automatically. Uh, imputation, we have Lex that can deconcatenate or um, gate apart your matrix, maybe you have some barcodes information, you can gate those apart with Lex. Um, if you have several batches of data, maybe grouped together in a single file, um, and you need to correct, correct for any batch effects, um, you can do that with the Bachelor plugin. And then some other types of vis visuals uh, would be like UMAP, TriMap, Monocle, Violin box, fate plugins, and then different types of clustering options other than like the native K means um, would be Phenograph. That's one of um, my favorite clustering algorithms. Um, we have a couple versions that one that runs in R, one that runs in Python. Surat will also do clustering. Surat's a real popular one. It's more of a, um, an entire pipeline. So it can do QC, um, principal component analysis, TSNE, UMAP, um, cluster, and then also returns back up and down regulated gene sets, comparing all those clusters that were found. ISLR can also do um, similar type of workflow like Surat. Um, and then we also have a, a VDJ Explorer plugin, if you have any VDJ data. And to get to the plugins, you would go to the workspace tab, plugin drop down menu, and then choose your selected plugin. If you want to view the plugins and what's available, um, you can click this Flojo Exchange button and it'll take you to the Flojo Exchange where you can download and install those plugins. Plugins will come with um, how to PDF that kind of walks through the installation steps there and shows you how to use the plugin. Um, I recommend getting a trial license. We do have a 60 day trial license available um, and it comes with, uh, you can see here on the left, several different um, data files, demo data files that you can use um, to explore um, SeekGeek and um, try to become familiar with the analysis and workflow there. 
Um, let's see, someone's got a question about uh, Flojo dongle. Does it work with SeekGeek? Um, no, it does not. Um, SeekGeek um, requires a portal account, um, which is um, just an online thing where you sign in with a username and password. And so if you sign up for um, a SeatGeek trial, you'll get um, you'll get signed up also for a, a portal account at that same time. <clears throat> and then exports. So from the layout editor, similar to like Flojo, uh, we can export those really high resolution images directly from um, the layout editor. Again, gene sets developed during your analysis. You can export those as CSV tables or even GNT library files. <clears throat> Populations are parameters. Um, you can export those directly from within the workspace. Um, those could be populations of cells along with genes, or if you've derived any other type of parameter like TSNE or UMAP embeddings, those can also be exported right from the workspace. Um, and then if you want additional figures or table options, some of those are available through some plugin functionality. Right. Um, and if you do have any questions, um, I would say a good resource is our documentation. So docs.flojo.com forward slash SeatGeek or forward slash Flojo. Um, is our online searchable document uh, has a lot of um, good information there, how to set up plugins, um, walks through um, a basic tutorial, shows you the different steps um, within SeatGeek. So that's a great place to start. We also have Flojo University, um, another online resource. And here we have a lot of pre recorded videos um, that are like much shorter than a pre recorded webinar. So just focusing on maybe a couple, couple like particular steps um, for doing something normalization or um, dimensionality reduction. So there's a lot of good videos here at Flojo University. And of course, if you have any um, questions or need help setting up um, SeatGeek or any of the plugins, you can reach out to technical support for um, any help with that at seekgeek at bd.com. Also, there's um, my email right here as well. So feel free to reach out um, after this webinar if you have any questions or once you're getting into um, using seekgeek. So I'll check the chat one more time. You're welcome. Okay. Okay, so let's next um, take a look at um, some analysis directly in SeatGeek. So again, here's um, how you sign in. I just use my portal ID and password. Okay, so here's the workspace. It's, um, if you use Flojo at all, you're probably familiar with this um, type of layout here. Um, here's some of the SeatGeek extras that come with um, the downloaded um, SeatGeek application. So we have some demo data sets here. We'll go ahead and just drag and drop to load it into the workspace. You'll see um, we also have some gene sets available um, and some GMT or gene set libraries available as well. So you can use these um, directly in, in SeatGeek, dragging them into the, the gene set area. Um, or let me show you um, some options here in preferences. So I'm going to the heart icon in the upper right. Um, we'll get you to preferences where you can kind of control the look and feel of SeatGeek. Um, 
Going down here to diagnostics, this is where we would set, for example, our R path. If we're going to use some R based plugins. And I've just created a, a folder where I put those downloaded plugins. And there's an option here scan for gene sets. So if I have this selected, um, you can see I have this path to this folder for my gene sets. Uh, if I had that option selected here, um, whenever I load a, a new workspace, all these gene sets would automatically be loaded into the workspace if I wanted to use those um, to make any kind of comparisons with my particular data. Um, so fonts, you can get through here and like control um, the size of the fonts in different areas of the workspace, graphs, um, legends, tables, things like that. Uh, you can choose some default like favorite type of gating tools, whether they're tinted or not. Um, different graph types. Here we can set um, a p-value threshold guideline um, and the um, the methods used, Bonferroni, FDR, or none. Um, and then this is where, again, where we're um, setting those threshold guidelines, that dotted line that we see in the volcano plots. So if you want to make an adjustment, you can do that right here. Okay, so back in the workspace, first thing we have to want to do is just select our population. And what I'm going to do is go up here to quality control and start the first quality control steps in our analysis. And on the left, we're again looking at cell view. And so here I can um, choose a polygon tool and then just start um, drawing a gate to remove um, what might be empty wells or doublets. And double click to close, and I just call this quality cells. And then notice it creates a new um, population in the workspace. And then the next two are in gene view. Um, right now they're on linear, so I typically come in here and I'll set these like on a log scale for both. <clears throat> and here again, we're looking at total reads versus cells expressing. So um, <clears throat> you have a choice to draw a gate in this first gene view window. You don't have to perform any gating right here. Um, in this case, I'm going to go ahead and just draw a gate at around 10 for both total reads and cells expressing, and then just include everything up above that. I'll just call it filtered. So I'm just filtering out some genes that are um, low number of reads and not expressed in many cells. And then our second gene view window is where in this upper left, now I can choose to look at all genes, or maybe I just want to look at what's within this filtered gate that I just drew. So I'll select filtered, and that's 20,000 genes. You can see it removed all these events to the left. <clears throat> and so here, what I want to hopefully find is um, some genes that are going to help us describe the data with um, PCA and, and TSNI. So typically, um, genes that are highly dispersed or highly variable um, are going to help us pull apart um, subsets within the data. So I'm just going to start drawing a gate here across this upper portion of genes. Um, and then I'll call this HDGs for highly dispersed genes. Um, and notice now I have um, two gene sets created over here. Um, 
when we're drawing a gate here in Gene View, we're not removing any data um, from our analysis. We're just um, <clears throat> choosing what we, what we want to look at um, for some of these downstream steps. We can always come back and um, adjust this gate or make an entirely new gate. Um, you'll see uh, once you get to using Seek, it gets often uh, an, an iterative process where you might be coming back and looking at different um, subsets of genes or parameters in your analysis. So this is just a good place to, to kind of start with highly variable genes here. And um, as I'm going, like what I would like to do here is um, add these plots to the layout editor. So I just, with a selected plot, um, press Command L and it adds it to my layout here on Windows. Um, Control L does the same thing. Okay, and I can use this arrange tool to kind of align everything nicely. And here I'll just call this my QC. Okay, so those um, graph windows. Um, okay, so now that we have a highly dispersed gene set, um, what I wanna do next is um, select this quality cells. I'm gonna go to um, dimensional edge reduction and first start with um, principal component analysis. Okay, we can we can choose to name these resulting principal components in a way. So I'm just going to call them PC. And here, select genes. I'm going to again choose my highly dispersed. So I'll say add selected, and it's going to use all of those genes to calculate my first 25 principal components. Just click run here, and I'll quickly make that calculation and return back um, the summary of the variance of those. 25 principal components. And we can see here the um, percent variance that's described quickly tapers off here. Um, and I'll just select the top 15 and click OK. And then next, we'll be presented with um, our first two principal components in a graph window. So I'm going to make a new layout. I'm going to call this PCA DR for dimensionality reduction. And again, I'll just um, kind of keep track of the steps in my analysis by adding this information into my layout. So here's the first two principal components. Um, and what you can do instead of like expanding and selecting, um, you can actually hold down the command key on a Mac or control on Windows and click and it'll just cycle through the next, you know, parameter within your list. So without opening here, I'm just holding command and switching to my next set of principal components to view. And you can see um, once we get down to like the last couple, um, it becomes, the shape tends to become more of just a sphere or a circular shape. Um, and we can see we're just not describing much variance in these um, last few principal components, which is normal and expected. So really taking, if I would have taken all 25, um, they may not have really been helping me much um, when I use these later on um, in TSNI or UMAP, for example. Okay, so here's my principal components. And next, I'm gonna go back to dimensionality reduction. This time I'm gonna run TSNI. And um, here I'll go select genes, but this time, instead of genes, I'm gonna use parameters and search for my 15 princip principal components add these. And here I'm just going to go with the Opsni option and just click run. So we're using principal components to generate our TSNI. 
again, a new layout. I'll call this TSNE. Command L, add that to my layout editor. And if I wanted to look at a different view, maybe I can switch here to a contour plot. I can add that to the layout. Um, so here I can see some of this um, island here is kind of cut off from view. So I'm gonna go in here to my transform, customize access, and then search for my TSNE. I'll select one and two. And I just wanna add a little bit of space towards the bottom end of my graph. Say so apply. Um, oh, looks like I do it up here for the positive as well. Maybe just TSNE2. There we go. Okay, so from the same view, um, I can apply like a, a tertiary parameter, like color axis. So for here, I will search for the MITF gene. And here we can see um, in this graph window, we have now some areas of TSNE that are um, you know, expressing more highly for this particular gene. We can change display to show large dots if we want. Sometimes if you don't have many cells, it's a little easier to see those populations by showing large dots. Um, I can grab a, a pencil tool and I can gate directly um, here on TSNE. Call M1 for malignant one. Um, and then I'll do it again for another population. Let's grab this one. Okay, so gating and cell view return two populations back in my workspace. Um, so I can go to gene view right here and then um, choose my two populations I wanna compare. So I have M1 on the Y and then M2 on the X. And right now uh, in gene view, it's showing again, all genes. So maybe I just wanna see what's highly dispersed. Okay, so we can see there's some differential expression between those two populations of interest, but I don't really know um, where the level of significance is here. So I want to generate a volcano plot. Okay, and here's my volcano. Again, sometimes um, if you don't have a lot of um, parameters, you can switch to large dots if you like. Uh, okay, I'm just gonna grab a rectangular tool here and here at, let's say um, fourfold up, I can draw a gate and I could say fourfold up and malignant one versus malignant two. And I can do a similar thing here. And then this would be fourfold up and two versus one. Okay, and that created um, some new gene sets. And again, I'm gonna just continue to add these plots here to the layout as I go along. Okay, so with these gene sets, I can like double click to open them up and um, get a closer view of what those parameters are, their full change and Q values. If I click edit gene set, it'll bring me back to this volcano plot. If I wanted to reposition, maybe look at twofold up instead of fourfold, uh, you can do that. Uh, 
um, right click on any of these gene sets. Uh, you can edit, export, or um, do an enrichment test. So if we have um, some GMT files, uh, we can try to do an enrichment test and see if um, that can help us discern like what um, that particular population consists of. So I can go choose. And then again, um, SeekGeek comes with some of these um, GMT files. So I'll go down here and I'll choose this um, human GMT file. Click open. Let's see if it's able to find anything. Uh, nope. This is not a good um, comparison here. We can try again with this other. So it already has that option selected. I'll click run. No, unfortunately, these um, did not help us for these two populations. Um, you could always take um, this gene set. And from here, there's different ways you could um, command all to select, copy them, and you could paste them into something like um, Excel, or I'll just show you quickly here in like um, a text editor. So you can paste all that information into a text editor. And you could take this online to some other databases like Panther or Enricher um, and get an idea of like what these, um, these genes are. Okay, so um, that's some of the built-in functionality there. We have um, additional plugins. So let's look at something like um, another type of clustering. If we don't wanna um, draw gates and TSNI space, maybe we want to run um, a plugin that will try to identify those populations for us in an unbiased fashion. Um, so here again, I can like feed in um, my principal components even into these clustering steps. So I'll choose um, my 15 principal components here. Um, I'll just increase my K number here and click OK. So this is Phenograph version 2.4 runs in R. We have a version 3.0 that runs in Python. Um, well, it returns you know, the same type of information back to the workspace. Um, and we should just get some populations, clusters back in the workspace. And so with this, um, what we can do is also, if I view our TSNI, one and two, so it might be available here, TSNI2. Um, I can make an overlay in the layout editor and get an idea of how well does my clustering agree with um, my TSNI embedding. Okay, so now <clears throat> I've identified um, some populations without um, drawing any gates and just letting the algorithm kind of find those automatically. And so here, let's just look at um, large dots. And let's see, yeah, we do actually see um, that Phenograph did find um, these clusters based on some gating that I had done um, previously. So instead of doing um, a volcano plot just on my manual gates, I could take these phenograph clusters directly and do that same type of um, comparison and find genes that are up and down regulated between these um, phenograph clusters. Okay, and that's more of an unbiased approach to um, identifying populations. Um, 
um, from your layout. You can also um, export these images, PNG, PDF, and SVG. These two will give you the highest resolution. Um, you can, from here, get into the properties, and then you'll see there's the option to um, adjust resolution here. So you can get some really nice high resolution images exported um, directly from here. There's options, some fun options too, to um, change dot shapes, colors, so you can um, really create some really nice looking images directly here in the layout editor. Okay, so we're just a little bit over time. Um, I think I've shown you most of what um, I was hoping to show you today. Does anyone um, have any other questions about SeatGeek or any of the steps we've done here? Again, we have um, a lot of our online resources. docs.flojo.com forward slash SeatGeek um, is a good place to start. Um, again, I would recommend um, signing up for that 60 day trial and um, downloading the data and um, just walking through some analysis on your own. And as you have any questions, feel free to just reach out um, to SeatGeek at bd.com or directly to my email there.